the cost of um, the layer ramps should not be going mm. to one million every year mm. if, if government comes in and you know, lends a hand in production. And even for your daily needs? The cost of rams is not one million anymore. A layer is gone. Salah has gone. You you find maybe now seventy five thousand, hundred thousand. Yeah. Mm. So it was artificially induced. People mm. were cashing in on emotions, emotions, religious sentiments, and emotions was what we bought. People bought for one million during Salah. <music> conversation first taking a quote from Ronald Reagan who once said surround yourself with the best people you can find delegate authority and don't interfere as long as the policy you have decided upon is being carried out okay does that even work for Nigeria anyways we'll move to the next one and this one is from Benjamin Franklin who once said honesty is the best policy absolutely spot on my last one will be from boris johnson who said that my policy on cake is pro having it and pro eating it whatever that means very warm greetings and welcome to the conversation we're reaching you for captain's television city here in the nation's capital abuja i am annabelle Ojin. now let's see how those quotes relate to what we'll be discussing today my guest on the show today is Kola Alakmini, international human rights lawyer, and we'll be talking about, they say there's the um, science and the politics to the proposed Ministry of Livestock. So today we'll turn attention to the political aspect of it, and then later we'll talk about the science um, in that regard. But then we'll also talk about the Samo uh, Agreement. Some people have turned it to something else, even though the NBA is saying another thing. And then you have the National Assembly come out to say that they did not strike it out. So many things in just one agreement. Call Alakwin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Like I said, way too many kind of controversies in just one agreement. What is happening? What is there something that okay, in your let's um let's view that um agreement from your professional lens. Tell us about it, especially to that layman who's watching, who just hears some more agreement. And the only thing that comes to that they are being told about it is LGBTQ+. What else can you tell us fully um, with regards to this agreement? Tutor, oh, the, the agreement is about trade, human rights, democracy, justice, etc. And they are going to give us about $150 billion, um, to support us. But the parts which the newspaper uh, which broke the story focused on was when it talked about um, supporting the rights of um, all um, sorts of people and they just ran to town and said that it, it, it would include lgbtq i think they were very uninformed you know? and i speak with a background of someone who was a journalist uh, uh, before studying law i trained as a journalist first it's very responsible and they came out with an apology, uh, a lame foot apology, saying um, if, if they were wrong, they take responsibility. Uh, so that you come out straight and just say, hey, we got it wrong, we ran with the wrong story, etc. That's the way to come about it. And we have to be very careful in, in our country. Uh, issues like this you know, could spark um, protests. Um, religion is a very touchy subject. We are one of the most... <laughs> We're one of the most um, controversial people in the world when it comes to uh, religion. We have churches and mosques everywhere. It hasn't reflected in our lifestyle. Okay, so same-sex marriage and everything, it's also a big issue in Nigeria. We actually criminalized it. We have, we have an act of parliament that uh, you know, prescribes 14 years imprisonment for anyone in same-sex marriage. So that was very irresponsible of the newspaper. To, to blow that out of proportion. And, and tongues have been wagging, as I said. I have read the agreement myself, and with my background in uh, international law and you know, treaties and conventions. Actually, Annabelle, when you want to sign an international treaty or a convention, etc., an agreement, there's what they call you know, a derogation clause. Okay? And 
they give you a time limit as well to be able to raise objections. So it could be 90 days, some could be like a year or two or three. Look at Brexit mm. that happened in the United Kingdom. The, the British had a derogation clause. They could exit the agreement if it was not favorable. They went into that agreement with reservations. The whole of Europe um, spends the euro. And the Brits didn't change their money. They held on to the pound sterling. Those are parts of the derogation. You can say, hey, I'm going to hold on to my currency. Right. I've not joined a single uh, currency, euro, euro currency for the whole of Europe. That's one. Also, on how they will exit, there were derogation clauses there. So I don't know what the Bula Balu was all about as a president to say. <laughs> I don't know what the Bala Blue was all about. <laughs> um, that's where, you know, um, shouting in a safe. Um, and the NBA has come up with very robust statements. Mm. That uh, there was nothing to worry about. Of course, and you can see how sensitive it is with the National Assembly you know, mm. saying, hey, Nigeria must step down because all interests, you know, you have the um, traditional worshippers there, you have the Christians, Muslims, non believers. The, the, the National Assembly is supposed to be the direct representative of everyone. So that's the House of Nigeria. Mm. And you can see how vehemently they, they opposed it, uh, all because of the irresponsible uh, reporting. By that newspaper, mm. but I, I don't I don't think there's uh, anything to worry about yeah? because okay. we we have a law mm. um, in Nigeria as a sovereign nation. So, uh, so and the position of that law, you cannot bring in that uh, new agreement to uh, obtain obtain the law. It's not possible. Okay, right. Now, let me ask you, because taking a key from where you landed with regards to the fact that we already have a law and we cannot bring something else to obtain what we have already mm. on ground, is it even possible? Because I like, would like to at least um, speak to those who have that mindset, let them understand. So I'm asking you, is it possible for any administration just because they need funds to they need to raise funds to either um uh, go through or do something and then they now decide okay we have a law but let's still bend it a little bit and then tilt towards whatever it is whoever is giving us a grant or a loan is asking for is that ever possible no okay that's the short answer it's an act of parliament the only way we can tweak with it is to go back to parliament hmm. Now, going back to the fact that you talked about the National Assembly and the controversies around it, I, I, I watched where one member of the National Assembly was talking about the fact when they were arguing on um, that it should be stepped down immediately. I watched where one of them was saying, talking about the fact that it talked about gender. And according to him, I will quote him, he said that since you're talking about gender today, it's no longer a male-female thing when you talk about gender you also see others or oh, i prefer not to specify so if you have that clause gender so that's the reason why it's bringing these controversies since you're talking about gender so now it means we're not talking male female we're talking others also what that do you doesn't that? apply in nigeria it doesn't apply in nigeria our laws have taken care of that mm. uh, yeah with the legislation it doesn't apply but you can't wake up in the morning tomorrow and say you're a man or I wish to be addressed as a man. The Nigerian laws don't allow for that. So regardless of the fact whether you are um, applying for unemployment, as long as it's in Nigeria, gender means male, female, X, Y, Z. That's, that's, the, that's the position of our law. That's what that act say. Okay. That, that's uh, same sex uh, provision. If you read that act, that's what it says. Mm. So except that law is changed, you cannot wake up one morning and say, I'm no longer Miss Annabelle. I'm now uh, something else. It's not possible under, ah. the, under Nigerian law. Okay, so um, one of the headlines this morning, and I was trying to find out which one of them, but then it was talking about the fact that um, the lawmakers, um, they decided they um, turned their back and then said, okay, no, they are not, um, they didn't withdraw the Samo agreement when we knew how they were vehemently talking about, no, it needs to be squ uh, quashed immediately. Why do you see this? We're neither here nor there. Yeah, because of the controversy which it generates. So today they are saying, yes, we don't want it tomorrow. What they, what they said was, uh, stand it down and let's um, look at it more. And this is a problem with rumors or you know, social media, 
when a newspaper runs such a controversial story, which has ended up not to be true, and they're trying to apologize, and the apology is neither here nor there. You have to look at the cultural uh, relativism in Nigeria, or histor historical uh, underpinnings, and uh, it, it doesn't support LGBTQ uh, issues. Uh, Nigeria is vehemently opposed to it, whether we like it or not. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gone to parliament and actually written a law that criminalizes it. Mm. So uh, you can understand the sentiments that was whipped up and uh, people are saying, hey, these, that, let's uh, take a second look, let's do that. It's all right to take a second look. You know, just, no, nothing's going to change. And you can read the statements of the Nigerian Bar Association president. The NBA is the conscience of the nation. And that's why it's always very critical to make sure that we have the right person as NBA president. You know? yeah, especially when... Um, yeah, it seems as if our politicians have um, gone haywire and nobody's listening to us. Uh, the NBA historically has always been the conscience of the nation and a very uh, super strong uh, peer pressure organization. If not, has it always been? Always been. been. It's historically, well, from the days of Alawa Kabashara, Richard Akijide, and the NBA is, is a conscience. So if you have to compare the days of Alawa um, Bashar to today, has it always been? It's a, in the absence of nothing, the NBA is still the only one standing um, when it comes to um, being the conscience of the nation. The NBA is not a political party. Right. And it doesn't behave like one. Uh, this is the distinction between organized labor, uh, floating the party known as the Labour Party. You know, it's, uh, the NBA will never float a political party. We're non partisan. And we say it as it is. That's what it, that's. That's why I said the NBA is a conscience of the nation, and it's, um, the figurehead of that, the poster boy of that, is the NBA president. When he when he says something, you know, the president um, would have to take a look at it. Why do you think every time the NBA is opening his um, its um, annual general conferences, the president act and comes to address? It doesn't send somebody else. The president comes himself. Mm. So it's, it's, it shows you that the NBA is very relevant, and and, and government listens to what the NBA says very seriously. Uh, for them to come out with a robust statement like the DBS, the president you know, of the NBA, um, to say, look, we've looked at this, and if it were not in the interest of Nigeria, all Nigerians we would have said so. So I, I think it was um, uh, the, the newspaper I ran with it didn't get. And you know, this is one of the problems. When I was a um, law editor of New Age newspapers, uh, youngs ago or 20 years ago, you would find out that a lot of the reporters who were in court did not even understand the language of the court. And they would call me to ask, oh, can you break this down for us? And this, I had a very good friend, uh, the late, uh, late um, judiciary correspondent with Channels TV, took him out and I could see, and he would say, oh, can you come online, uh, come on air and break it down? What were they saying? And this and that. So there's a disconnect. We need specialized reporters. They, we call these beats specialized beats. You need specialized reporters who understand the language of the courts, for instance, to be able to cover the courts. The ordinary person who studies English or linguistics or whatever, English, right, written English is different from legal English. So you, they, they, there's a difference between you know, discharged and acquitted and discharged, for instance. You know, and, and these are the things that, you know, people uh, will struggle with if, if they cover specialized bits. And you'll find out in international organizations, once someone is placed on a specialized bit, they hold that bit for donkey years. It could be judiciary reporter for like 30 years or covering war zones or conflicts. Look at Christian Amampo for decades, you know, or Becky Anderson and so many greats like that. So because you, you acquire so much experience on it and you become an institution for a very long time, the BBC, Jane Orox used to be known for conflict reporting. If um, a conflict is happening in any part of the world and Genorox is not there yet, then it's not a big conflict. Once you see Genorox, oh, you know that the UN is coming very soon. So th that's that's one of the, the paucity of... Um, and it's telling on every part of our, of our national national life, okay? It, 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 it's it's the declining standards in education. In, in, um, in, um, it, it's now seeping into our professional life as well. And, you have uh, people who are not even ordinarily that story should have been you know vetted twice or thrice 
the copy editors, the sub editor, they should have done that. So you know, double checking the news editor, right. it just so, so, so it doesn't just come out. It's it's a lapse. They took their eyes off the ball, and it could have snowballed into something else. See what happened with um, uh, I've forgotten her name, Isioma something. When she covered, she when she wrote an article for this day, those days were regarding the the pageant, the beauty pageant that was going to be held in the Miss World and everything, and there was just just a lapse. A, a, a momentary lapse of judgment on the on the on the on the side of the editors, and and, and that was it. You know how many people were killed in Abuja because of that article? She had to be whisked out of the country and and sought political asylum somewhere else. So yeah, mm. yeah. It, it, this thing, these issues are very volatile in Nigeria, and, mm. and you need to be careful very how you careful. approach them. Yeah, very very careful because they're very sensitive. I like the fact that you actually stated that even though you see. Um, Labour Party, NLC, the NBA, we're not looking forward to seeing Nigeria Bar Party sometimes. It would never so, happen. That, never. I, that, it's actually refreshing to note. Mm -hmm. But then, this past few, this few, past few days, I've seen um, um, comments and then people asking, I've seen even um, links, people sending links, um, uh, click on this link and um, when you click on it, um, disagree to the Samoa agreement and then get 10 gig uh, of any um, airtime of your choice or data of your choice. How do we, how do we begin to, we're doing one of them, at least demystify or at least send the right messages apart from the media. What is organizations like um, NOA supposed to be doing at this time? Call yeah, number one, don't click on those links. Those are scammers and they're going to you know, hijack your phone from you. Mm. Especially if you don't have the, the two-step verification and everything, right. they can hack into your phone, hack into your bank account. Be very, very suspicious of all these links that fly around and tell you if you click it, you get this. Now, nah, nah. it's a, there's no free meal in free time, yeah. There, there is none, and you're going to lose your control of your phone. Mm. Okay, so just to put that out there, well, I think a couple of weeks ago we we're talking about using the role of the NOA and uh, you know information ministry and all. So it, it shows that. Um, uh, we're not stepping up to 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 our game. You know, we're not opening our game, stepping up to the plate, and putting this information out there. Uh, our population has increased exponentially in the last twenty years. These are not the days when the NTA was just a bare month. It was the the major source of news those days were newspapers and the NTA. And you, you could broadcast into whether when we were 19 states or 21 states or 36 states, everybody had to be hooked to NTA and FRCN to hear this. The world has moved very fast from those days. It's, it's a much more digital world. Everybody carries the world in the palm of their hands through the mobile phone. So whatever goes out out there, you know, we have to be, you have to be circumspect and check and double check. And I think, you know, all these orientation agencies themselves have to, you know, be able to speak the language we understand by going digital, um, not just you know, jingles and um, on radio and TV and everything. They need to, you know, confront uh, our current situation in a digital way. It's as if they're still stuck in the analog years. You saw, you saw it during the NSAS protests. These kids are computer whiz kids. The whole world is on, in your palm. Hmm. And the, the government was struggling to catch up with them because the government is slow and uh, it's a behemoth, it was analog. And these kids could organize themselves. Even the London riots in 2008, 2000, everything was done on Blackberry. And the British police had to force Blackberry to open the codes so that they could control that riot. So the world has moved. We've gone into the cryptocurrency, encryption. It's very difficult now. So you can't be solving these issues if you are not digital. And you saw the response of the states. It, it was a brutal response, an analog response. Go in there, switch off lights, open fire on them, and disperse the crowd. That was the only way they could quell it. They couldn't respond in a digital manner. They, we couldn't even do digital policing. Mm. You couldn't even do digital policing. All right. So now let's move straight to, I'm sure that um, our viewers I have been able to at least understand what the Samoa Agreement is all about. And now you know what it is. So let's go straight to what the matters of our discussion today. Um, that's the proposed Ministry of Livestock. 
yes, there's the political side angle to it, and then there's the um, science to it. So a lot of people say, okay, yes, we agree to the fact that it's um, that's like a way to settle the farmer herder clashes, and then some other person say, oh, what do we need if you if you return back to um, the Orosoya's report, and then you say that during the Orosoya's report we need to cut cost of governance, at least shrink it a little bit, remove. You have um, um, conflicting departments or ministries. You have EFCC, you have ICPC, right? You have all of that. You have the CCB and all, at least reduce them. But then on the flip side, you have, um, you might be having the Ministry of Livestock and then you still have the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. Do you see it as just one too many doing the same thing? Um, first, I think the Federal Ministry of Agriculture already had had the Department of Livestock. Right, so, did you do? Yes, I do. I know FDA because my parents used to work in civil service. And I know that there, there used to be a federal department of livestock. I don't know if it's still there anymore. And I also know that during the Western region, um, governments of uh, Chief of Afrika Maolo and all that, the Western region had all these um, livestock uh, ventures which they, you know, they brought in bulls for for rearing and you know they all got destroyed during the military years after a while we just stopped rearing and this time <laughs> from what i hear we just uh, send a message from the hierarchy for oh, we've come to get one of the bulls and they, they look for the big size ones and off it goes to the officer's mess or the governor's lodge for an event for the military, <laughs> for the military administrator or something was happening. And uh, so we essentially ate all our breeding bulls, which we were supposed to be using for livestock. But that, uh, that's on the, light side, uh, on the light side. I think what the president is trying to do is to uh, create something uh, to address the issue of the other farmer thing. Uh, really. You know, the previous administration raised the issue of Ruga, and, 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 and these issues are very, very sensitive. Mm. For instance, you want, when this Ruga thing came up and you want to take people's land for ranches and all, people didn't trust the government because the government had always looked the other side where you had Fulani headsmen who were armed with killer weapons just pouring into the country and, you know, going on rampage on people's farms. So, People feel, why would I yield my ancestral land to a government that is not protecting me, that is not seizing these weapons of this Fulani headsmen or killer headsmen or terror headsmen, whatever name you want to call them? We know that they are headsmen. They follow cattle and they, are, they bear weapons and they don't care whatever you've planted on your farm. They just push their cattle into your farm. If you try to say what, they just spray the whole village. Hundreds of people are, are gone for me. I think that's where the government should start from. Not of these weapons from circulation. Arrest anybody that violates those laws. Make them know and understand that farming is private business, just as um, rearing cattle is, is private business. We need to establish those lines. Otherwise, there's nothing stopping the man from Arutuku who has moved to Lagos to come and learn how to be a spare parts dealer mm -hmm. or was moved to day day to and it, it, it goes through the service for five years or so learns it and uses private capital to set up his own business what is the government going to do to, to, to for such a person mm -hmm. is government going to set up set them up in business is government giving them uh, palliatives is, how is government helping them so it, it's unfair advantage for me from my own eyes and i might be wrong for you to be looking for land uh, to give um, people who are from everywhere north of Nigeria or north of Africa, just pushing the cattle into, or from West Africa, pushing the cattle into Nigeria to say, okay, we're going to collect land for you or set up this, set up that. We're going to, we're going to help you this. Who's helping the business? Who's helping the farmers, for instance? Not even the spare part. What are we doing for the farmers? What are we doing to the people on the streets who are hungry? So there will be a lot of controversy and animosity if you're trying to create a special breed of people uh, which this livestock, uh, whatever, ministry is going to help. Government has to be transparent, has to be open. Um, 
is government running it for themselves? Is, is our government going to go into livestock rearing? Maybe uh, people, the citizens, will be able to trust the government if it's if if government is not handing, um, you know, giving handouts to uh, private headsmen. Same Yeti Allah, for instance, or Macban, and setting them up with uh, ranches and all. It's good. The government is going to have a crisis because you cannot come to the ancestral land of people and take it over and give it, hand it over to one organization, cultural areas organization, to say you are helping them to set it up. I don't have all the details of this, how the Ministry of Livestock is going to work. But if oh, government is looking at setting up government ranches and providing an alternative, you know, some sort of subsidy. To right. the general populace, then people will buy into it, mm. but and, and that would actually create more internally generated revenue. Yeah, it will. Uh, it's a multi-billion naira or multi-billion dollar industry. You're talking about dairy, dairy farming, um, meat, beef generation, this, that, animal loss boundary. Of course, you know, and we cannot just focus on that alone. What are we doing about uh, fisheries? Mm. Because there's some people who prefer fish. So why would you, government be pumping a lot of money into livestock farming and government is not talking about fisheries? If we have a ministry of marine and uh, blue economy or whatever, right. what, are we, what are we doing about that? Is Are you going to help the fisherman in honor with his business? Mm -hmm. If we're thinking of creating a livestock, whatever, to help uh, Fulani headsmen or to, to stop the herder farmer clashes. So it has to be looked at holistically. Government has to be transparent and we have to be fair. Otherwise, we're going to create a superhuman category and you'll have a lot of people rushing into livestock farming because government is pumping money into it. It will crash. It will not be sustainable because it's not been done organically. We saw it with what the MFLA tried to do under the previous administration with rice pyramids and then this and that and they just pumped a whole lot of money. What we did was we had a lot of rice millionaires and we have less rice to eat. That's where there's food insecurity as well. If a, a previous government is coming in and this, a bag of rice costs 7,500 naira or 8,000 maximum and by the time you're leaving it's costing 80,000. You shut the borders, you say you want to grow rice, so you created rice millionaires who took various loans from the central bank and they are not going to pay back. And then, what did we have? Food, like that, what we food insecurity. To, what we used to have then when they said um, plenty water, but not to, drink. to drink. Yeah, mm. I think it was Gabriel Okara who did that. I'm not very sure of my facts. Gabriel Montini Okara who wrote that point. So you you, you have that crisis. Okay, well, um, Doctor Akinwo Additional came up with a, when he saw that there was so much corruption in the um, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, the fertilizer scheme. They came up with all these schemes where you could use your phone and uh, like digital acquisition of fertilizers. Mm. What has happened to it? We shifted away from that. We moved into rice, whatever. We, another scam. We've moved away again. We're going to livestock, whatever. So government needs to be sincere about it. Otherwise, it's going to go the way of all other government projects. It's good. All right, Kola, you've actually brought out another side to it, and we're going to unbundle that after this time. Do join us again. Welcome back. If you just joined us, this is The Conversation. We are reaching you from Capstan's Television today here in the nation's capital, Abuja. If you just joined us, you've actually missed us on the first part of the show, but then we'll go straight to our next segment. As we're still talking, we started um, from... Um, we talked about the Samoa Agreement, and now we're talking about the proposed Ministry of Livestock. My guest on the show today is Kola Alakbeni, international human rights lawyer. So we're talking about the politics to that ministry. Now, you talked about the fact that um, you actually opened it up, and then we need you to at least elaborate it more, especially for our viewers, especially, um, the layman who don't understand what livestock is. I hear you talk about fisheries. I hear you talk about, remind us the fact that we now have a new, even though it's not new, but at least a new ministry called the Blue um, Ministry of Blue Economy. And then you just begin to wonder, they should be cashing out or cashing in, whichever way, whatever the, the side of the fence that they sit. So help us open up this um, ministry of um, a life, help us unpack it fully. Is it? I hear some people say it is just cows and all, but then it means that we need to add some other side to it. Kindly help us unpack um, livestock before we now talk about the Ministry of Livestock. 
Okay. Uh, I have the, the beginner's knowledge of agriculture. Okay. Yeah. Limited knowledge. But my father was a farmer. He was an organized, uh, he went into mechanized farming in the late 70s and early 80s when we had Operation Food Division, right? tractors, irrigation system, and everything. So I have an idea about that, and crops and all. Um, husbandry, I think I learned from my grandma. So my grandma used to keep uh, livestock, chicken, um, um, goats, and all that. And that was a pet project when we were growing up. So on, on a bigger picture, when you're looking at what the government is trying to do, it, it goes beyond um, other f uh, farmer clashes. Mm. It goes beyond that. If the government was really going to um, go into this and make it a massive economy uh, boost for us. And I'll take a, f a few countries in the world where livestock is taken very seriously. Brazil, Argentina. Or your corn beef and everything mm -hmm. that's that's a big industry that's mm -hmm. where it's coming from the united kingdom for instance netherlands the united states uh, the farmers have a big say in even who the president comes out to be um, australia uh, canada countries that have huge um, space huge land to be able to do this stuff and also you have the countries that don't have huge land like like netherlands you know, the country is very contained but they've become experts in breeding in breeding um uh, cattle and, and dairy production and you see when you all those thin milk that you coast and peak and everything those those bulls and all those are that's that's an example of what the Dutch have, and then you can see the windmill at, at the, on the field, which shows that okay, this is what the Dutch do. Windmills are synonymous with, with Holland, with Netherlands now called Netherlands. Yeah. So it's a huge industry over there. We're talking about dairy, which is milk and everything. Uh, as you know, the only people who do dairy in Nigeria are the Fulanians, uh, with the Wara and Kwara states. Or look, like we don't. We used to have a veterinary you know, institute in Vaughan, you know, where. You know, they produced all this milk and all that. I think it just it's not it, it's not used what it used to be uh, years ago. So if the government is coming in to become a stakeholder in in livestock, so we're gonna have cattle, uh, we're gonna have sheep. From sheep, you have mutton, you have ram, you have then the cost of um, the layer rams should not be going mm. to one million every year. Mm. If if government comes in and lends the hand in production. And even for your daily meat? The cost of rams is not one million anymore. Ilea is gone. Salah is gone. You you find maybe now 75,000, 100,000. Yeah. Mm. So it was artificially induced. People mm. were cashing in on emotions. Emotions. Religious sentiments and emotions was what we bought. People bought for one million during Salah. Christmas will come. Price of chickens will go up. Blah, 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 blah. It's emotion. They're just capitalizing. With, who says that you must celebrate Christmas with a chicken? You can use tilapia fish. But it's emotion. The culture, the tradition, everything. You just attach a, a symbolism. With, you know, chicken, turkey, and everything. Um, we're not in a financial position to be living like this anymore. And we have to... If the government is coming in to support and pumping money to uh, a neglected area, well, all well and good. So far, it's not going to be seen to be favoring um, a, a certain group of people who have been known to be creating havoc and marching on people's lands. Otherwise, it seems as if you're creating a, a super set of people. Okay, Is that how you see it, Kola? I'm not the only one. I'm just saying things from one perspe perspective or my perception. I'm not the only one who thinks so. You, you, you're a journalist. You hear feedback from the streets, the telephone calls, everything. Because the man who sells peer parts says, okay, what are you doing for me? Why should you be pumping billions into a private business? Okay, you don't want Fulanese to march into farmers' lands anymore with AK-47. But you failed wi willingly as a government. You willfully failed by arresting the situation. You failed by re collecting the arms from them. You failed by trying them and making them scapegoats or an example. 
you turned the blind eye and looked away. Even when the farmers were being attacked, um, you, you call the police, they say, we don't have fuel, you call the army. And even the villagers accusing the military and, and, our, and our security forces of, of bias and partialness. So you're already coming from a position of bias. People don't trust you. People don't trust government. So they're looking, oh, you want to set this up again for full and aids, man. You want to collect our land. You want to give them land to, 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 to support their business. What support have you given me? So if government is not transparent and does not show itself not to favor one part over the other, it is a dead on arrival project. It's eventually to fizzle out. Let me go back to the question I asked with regards to these ministries. You have, um, um, we're talking about unbundling the um, anti-graft agencies and then say, okay, because we're cutting governance, let's reduce one and keep the other. So now if you have Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, you have Ministry of Livestock, you still have Ministry of Marine and Blue Economy, is that way too much doing the same thing, Kola? Well, um, it's a matter of approach and understanding. There's no reason for us not to have a dedicated ministry for uh, marine and blue economy, if we're serious about it. And if we want to put it together under the Ministry of Water Resources, we could have, and we could have run it successfully. So each government comes in and just does um, what it thinks is best uh, for for it. When I was go growing up in secondary school, um, the Ohio State government used to have a ministry of youth sports. They were almost like ministry of information, youth sports, and culture. And now that's like four ministries. You got all. It used to be one ministry those days. Ministry of Information, Youth, Sports and Culture. Now you have the Ministry of Information. Now you have the Ministry of Youths. Now you have the Ministry of Sports. In some places you have Ministry of Youths and Sports. Then you also have Ministry of Arts and Culture. It all depends. You know, if you have capable hands who are able to um, do it properly, what's the sense in proliferating ministries? That's one side of the argument. You, you spend more on running costs, spend more on logistics, spend, but you, you also have to look at the political, these political giants called Nigeria that the British have created. Now we are now, because of federal character and everything enshrined into our constitution, we must have uh, a minister, we must have a junior minister, and we must even do the Previous administration just walked all over us and it seemed as if it was only selecting people from one part of the country over the other. The, the whole essence was so that every part of the country will have a sense of belonging and will have federal presence. But I don't think we can afford it anymore. We're not in the financial position um, to, be, to be having a proliferation of ministries. We need a lean, mean machine to function as government. That's what we need. We need there's too much repetition, too much duplication. We need we need we need a compact. Mm. A compact we even the National Assembly is too huge. I, the whole idea is to have seven hundred and seventy four local governments represented and everything. But can we afford it? Uh, it's not just the salaries. Okay? The salaries are the most minimal expenditure. You know, so much goes on allowances. So much goes on, you know, all the other stuff that you don't see. So much goes on like, the pain of the aids, you know, the cars, the fueling of the vehicles, etc. It's uh, we need to plug our waste. Leakage, there's too much leakage in the system. But it has to start from the president himself. He's the number one person. It has to start from the president himself. You cannot ask be asking every other person to cut waste and you're still thinking of buying a private jet or two for the presidency or they're, they're muting you know, at some point in time talking about the yachts and even when uh, citizens shouted so much you cannot buy a yacht we're dying we're in hunger they said oh we've already bought it it was allocated under the last administration so we bought it like, this kind of crazy ideas or <laughs> they it, this is the reason why people don't trust government. Mm. Well, they cannot trust the government.
Mm. Because the government has not proved itself to be trustworthy. And then you just keep hearing, have patience. Um, things are going expensive. Yes, we understand. Um, one of my colleagues will always say, don't worry, I'm a biwale, just like the president would always say. But you just begin to wonder when exactly is this going to happen? Just like they said that in January, food prices will crash. And I know we've talked about that, but let, let, let's, let's move on our, to our stories. country is in an abusive relationship with us. Our, our politicians, our, the, the, the organs of the state, they're in an abusive relationship with Nigerian citizens. You know, what you just calmly said is like having an abusive boyfriend or an abusive girlfriend, an abusive spouse. And we keep telling you, just endure, just this. And this guy is plummeting me and beating me blue, black, and vice versa. We, have, we also have spouses, wives beating up the husband, and they're just telling you to stay in there, to keep on enduring. Okay? Or you're suffering. You can see this guy is spend thrift, or this girl spends all her money on shoes and bags and everything, and it's affecting the budget of the house. And she keeps telling you, don't worry, hold on, I'm working on myself, just tighten your bed, everything's going to get better. It's an abusive relationship. It's an abusive, abuse comes in various ways. It's not just domestic violence. It could, it's Financial abuse is one of the traits of an abusive relationship. And, and they tell you, you know, this, the person uses finance and money to control you and make sure you, do, you don't have enough to even fight for yourself. In, in an abusive relationship, money is weaponized. You don't have enough to fight for yourself. You don't have enough to take flight. You don't have enough to, you know, say, I'm getting out of this, I'm gonna get a house on my own. You just, it's just trickles to make you keep coming back or keep surviving. That's what, that's what the politicians do to us. They're not going to give you a big program that would set you free, but they make sure they hold you tie you to the apron string so that every four years when they give you 500 naira and ankara and uh, palm oil and everything you start jubilating and running after them because you feel oh this is my share of the national cake oh. it's an abusive relationship all right Kola, let's move straight to other stories and there's this one from uh, saying finally supreme court endorses autonomy for nigerian local government orders direct allocation of their fund bars governors from receiving their funds is this good news for you this we've been talking it about local fun. government autonomy for well, there used to be autonomy at this uh, 1999 when we were um, just starting this um, democracy i remember very well uh, where the law school in abuja and uh, almost every month the local government chairman would all <laughs> congregate in Abuja to come and get their funds. I don't know the reason. Maybe uh, banking has become more advanced now. Um, everything should have just been wired into the accounts of the local governments and the chairman didn't need to come all the way to Abuja. And they would lodge in hotels. The, you know how expensive that could be and they might be here for like a week or a little over a week before they get this allocation and they go back to their various states and uh, 20 days after or 20 days after they come again. So it was like a monthly pilgrimage to Abuja and all. And taking all the expenses of the chairman who would come in, some would live very far, would have to fly, some would live so far, would have to drive. And it just seemed as if we created another jamboree on its own. So if the um, federal government are able to um, fund the local governments directly and these funds get to the grassroots which it was meant for then it's best the problem that happened was that the local government chairman because they were collecting funds directly from the federal level became assertive to the governors of the state because mm -hmm. it will pays the piper dictates it too if you now, what the governors did was to try to crush the local government chairman by saying, the government pay me the money, um, federal government pay me the governor the money, and I will decide which local government gets what. Mm -hmm. So they hold on to that money, spend it on other projects, uh, qu you know, just quaff it, like they say. And that's why you see all the decrepit states of the local government. And that's why the government, the governors usually try to have uh, caretaker committee, some, they put a lackey there, someone who they can dictate to and all. But we need that constitutional 
frame to work the way it was designed and the local governments get their money and at least if anybody is misbehaving we can talk straight to the local government chairman and the local government chairman is not doing well just the same way we hold governors responsible mm -hmm. so it was a power play the local government chairman became too powerful for the governors and some of them were even trying to challenge the governors um, to run for the seats because it, it has it has its own funding mm -hmm. exactly and then these people will say oh you're doing well yeah it's our turn go on you to go for governorship so it was it was an existential threat to the governors and they had to quash their existence uh, by tightening the purse and making sure they didn't have any um, funding of theirs that's, mm -hmm. that's that was just the problem fine you might have a few local government chairmen who were excessive and all, but it's not all of them that will be excessive there will still be some who will be conscientious and want to do something for their local government especially mm -hmm. if they're from there mm -hmm. and they live there Okay, they are okay. the closest to the grassroots. They, mm. they usually, these are kids who grew up in that local government. You know, they know the place like the back of their hand, or are supposed to know the place, even more than the governors. You know, but you know, the governor, they they converse. You know, the, the, the governors forum has become very powerful in Nigeria. They converse and make sure that they hijacked that. You know, so it's good it's being returned back, okay. returned to the status quo, the way it was in nineteen ninety nine. And hopefully, you know, there, will, there will be some impact felt at the local government level. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a few questions and I'd like you to put them together still on this same matter. Now, you talked about the fact that um, some local government chairman now even became pa more powerful than the governors and the governors were not liking the idea and all of that. And then we've seen, um, with this judgment now, do you actually see the governors agreeing to it? Because we've seen so many um, court judgments and still people don't even heed to it. Do you see this? Um, do you see those governors accepting and doing, accepting to it fully? Or the, I mean, the 36 states um, governors, that's one on the side. And then, secondly, when you have, um, like you talked about, the um, local government chairman that would just want to throw money around, uh, at least now. Have they started? I'm trying to manage my word, but still, I would like to use um, the Nigerian language. With all that has happened, have they started having sense? Okay, it, it's a Supreme Court judgment, isn't it? Mm. That's, that's final. There's nowhere to go again. They have no choice. In any case, <laughs> the money comes from federal government. So the federal government is going to obey the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So it's just going to be paid to the local government um, purse directly. The, the state governors have no say whatsoever on it anymore. It's a final judgment of the Supreme Court. End of story. Whether the local government chairman have learned their say, well, have sense or not, learned their lesson, like you say, well, we'll, we'll soon find out. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of time. Absolutely. All right, let's move to our final discussion for today, women representation. You see how you have a lot of people who would complain that, yes, women are not um, well represented, especially in the National Assembly, in leadership, and whether it be the, uh, the governor. We see also how the last election went down. If you go to Adamawa State, even in the um, general elections where you had how many women, you can count them with, you know, at the tip of your finger, but then some other persons will say, how many women even um even went out all out to at least this is our own person let's still support her and all so are we ready for women representation if you look at the national assembly 104 members and then four, four of them as women are we ready to accept women and even are women too ready to come out well i think we need an affirmative action um to be in place. The, the type that we have in Rwanda uh, allows for almost 50% or more women to be uh, represented in, um, in these elective uh, spaces. There has to be a conscious effort. Otherwise, we'll keep on smothering them. Uh, and because of the kind of politics which we play, what is do or die politics, people getting stabbed on election day, ballots being stolen, ballot boxes and everything. If we have credible elections that are digital, electronic, um, transfer of results and everything, and then it means that whoever is popular, uh, who, if the woman candidate is popular, she will come out, people will vote for her. There's no fear of the votes being um, destroyed or stolen, and you have credible uh, people. There, there, there are uh, fantastic women 
um, who have gone into politics and done very well. Mm -hmm. um, the later uh, former Minister of Information, uh, who was in NAFTAC before, she mm -hmm. she had she Dora proved, Dora really proved herself very well, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 so many uh, people. You look at the judiciary; a lot of female judges doing very well. Lagos State is a trailblazer. Um, shout out to President Snobu who, and, and Professor Yemiya Shibaje who conceived the idea uh, in when they um, were in power in 1999. Um, Vice President Shibaje was Attorney General of Lagos State um, and Governor Tinobu was, um, um, was in charge and they pushed uh, a lot of, um, uh, you know, f the female gender into the judiciary and you, you can see all of them flourishing now years after. Uh, so there's no reason why we shouldn't have more f female politicians. Uh, I, I think women are, are conscious of of, uh, of government. They mm -hmm. would they would speak out, and um, we've seen it in all sorts of viral videos. There was a woman in Uganda who spoke out against the way the you know, government was spending money in Kenya, in mm -hmm. Ghana. You know, we, we need uh, credible women to come. In. There's a reason why. We refer to our native language as mother tongue because mother tongue is taught to you by your mom. She's the one who is at home. She's the one who says it to you. You are as good as your mom wants you to be. Yeah. You're that's, as good as your mom wants you to be. That is. That's it. The man is going to go out. If I am married to you, for instance, and we have a child, and I say, oh, this is the name I want to call customarily and I give the child a name, this is the name I want to call the child. And you also have a name that you've given to the child as well. Every day when I go to work, it is a name that you feel that you'll be calling that child. <laughs> when I come back, I'll be calling the child that name which I give him and the child is not listening. He doesn't understand <laughs> because all day the mom has been calling the child a different name. We eat what our mothers give us. Mm. Yeah. It's what your mom cooks that you will eat. It's what your mom, they like. if your mom speaks Igbo to you or Fufude to you or Yoruba to you, you will hear, that's why it's called mother tongue. If your mom keeps speaking English to you every time, you only speak English, a right, foreign ah. language. Mm. So uh, our first education, our, a man's legacy is as good as the wife he marries. Mm. You marry the wrong person, your legacy is, is, is messed up from the beginning because you, you will not be on the same page. Can two work together if you did not agree? If mm. you're going this way, this is the vision the father has. And the mother is going that way, you know, the, the house is split. The house is divided. Or it's, yeah, and it will never be united. Mm. So you need to be with someone of your values and everything. And that's why we need you know, the right woman in the right place. Not the type of show of shame we saw a few days ago where you had the Minister of Women Affairs and uh, shouting in Parliament at the, at, at, the, at the members of Parliament. No, that's not what I'm saying. Because I know that's what the, um, the other side will say. Oh, look at the woman we gave a chance. Look at what it did. Look at um, the Minister of... Um, humanity and disaster or whatever humanitarian. humanitarian and yeah coming and within months you know billions are flying left right center same thing with the foreign minister uh, you know who said she was feeding and school children during covid i mean I, those are the other flip side of the arguments of people say oh, but the, the few women we allowed in look at what they did but i can assure you that what the men do is 10 times that Absolutely. All right. Now let's end with the uh, social media comments. Some um, there's this um, um, people were arguing with regards to the fact that would you accept? Okay, let me bring the question to you, Kola. Would you accept um, an administration or a leader who would chop but at least work, or don't chop but work? There is nowhere in the world, so far, government spending is concerned that there is no leakage. It's it's a matter of semantics. Mm. The leakage is corruption. Mm. The, but some people choose, oh, the leakage is in government. It's corruption. Money is missing or money it's budgeted for as misappropriated or misapplied. There's mm. no difference between six and half a dozen. Mm. Oh, you, mis you misappropriated money. Or oh, you didn't misappropriate it. You misapplied it. It's the same. Okay? So, the, nowhere. Even in the United States, even in the United Kingdom, a few years ago when I was still living there, some members of parliament were sent to jail for fiddling with expenses. They were submitting false expenses, uh, where they lived, uh, how much they spent on mortgage and transport. You know, so that's it. There's nowhere. But at least they are conscientious. Mm. If you go to the United States, you'll see what they're doing with the taxpayers' money. 
you go to the United Kingdom, you see, look at Holland, the Prime Minister riding on bicycle, uh, days that. They lead by example, and right. people can see what their money does to them. So there's no perfect regime. Even in Russia, I mean, with Putin and everything, or China, yeah, there would always be leakages. There would always be misapplication. There would always be whatever. Okay. But let it trickle down. Do the right thing to the citizens. And people would not even really bother to be to be looking at the books if everybody's belly is full. The reason why everybody is shouting they being power or uh, hungry is because some people are feeding fat and driving in and it's not trickling big, down. It's not trickling down. And so people will be angry. So you you are telling me to tighten my belt. Look at you driving SUVs all over the place and eating in fancy restaurants on, on the people's money. And then you say I should I should starve. Why should I starve? So that means you agree, chop, but work. I'm just saying work. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Work and let everybody be happy. Ah, mm -hmm. Kola Lakwini, International Human Rights Lawyer. Thank you so much for coming. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, viewers. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you for keeping me company. I'll see you again next time. My name is Annabelle Oji. God bless you and yours. And God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Mm -hmm.